over the past week or two, I've been having discourse with some theists through private messages over the existence of God. Um, we've been going back and forth, and we were bringing up points, and 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 I was addressing his, and he was addressing mine, and. I mean, he didn't really find my answers satisfactory, and I didn't really find his answers satisfactory, so he eventually sent me this video to watch. It's a 23-minute a long video that's supposed to show his point of view and the argumentations for why he thinks God's, God exists. So I'm going to be addressing that video and responding to it. Now, this video might be split into a few parts, Actually, it's most likely to be split into a few parts, just because the video is really long. So, here's here's the first part. Basically, I was asked to talk a little bit about atheism and theism, and you know, the proof of God's existence and why should I believe in God anyway. All of which are very legitimate questions and very deep questions. None of these questions can be addressed in a one-liner. My wife has a one-liner about it. I'll share that with you first. She says, God exists whether you like it or not, and if you don't believe it, well, fine, he'll get you anyway. So, <laughs> so that, that could have been my talk. But <laughs> so basically, this argument is, God exists whether you argue if he does or not, and even if you're an atheist and you have all the reasons in the world not to believe in God, he still exists, and you're still going to hell. That's not a very... Um, persuasive argument and if anybody is swayed by such an argument that then I feel pity for them um, this is underestimating the intelligence of atheists which from my personal experience um, I found to be way more intelligent than the average person and I'll start after my wife I'll start with something that the ancient Bedouin Arab used to say like sometimes there would be people from other civilizations like the Persians or the Romans, they would do trade and before Islam, they would do trade sometimes or pass through Arabia and they'd see these Arabs, they still, even though they had shirk, they still believed in a God. They still be, believed in one supreme being. So somebody asked the Bedouin Arab, how do you know God exists? Kayfa amant? How did you come to faith? How did faith come to you? And you know these Arabs, they spend most of their time in the desert. So he said something really interesting. He, he pointed at his, camel, his camel's droppings. His camel's, you know, duty. He pointed at it, he goes, you know, because of that, I know my camel exists. That's all he said. That's all he said. And what did he mean by that? He meant there are, you know, when I see that in, in the desert, when you see something, it's a sign of something else. When you see a, like a, you know, a, a, a path or footprints, you know somebody walked by here. When you see a fire that's been put out, but there's burnt wood there and ashes there, you know some people were here camping and they left. There are traces here. He looks at all of creation and, as traces of God. Just like that, that small species in front of him is trace of his camel, that his camel's there. So that in his mind, there's no doubt. You know, I like this camel turd analogy way better than I like the watchmaker analogy, even though it's the same argument, just because camel turds suit this argument's maturity level. So, yeah, this argument is nothing more than an appeal to people's intuition. If it feels true, then it must be true. If, it's, if your intuition tells you that it's true, then you must follow your intuition. But that's not the case, because people's intuition also told them that the earth was flat, that the sun was revolving around the earth, and so on. Our intuition is not really a very well tool to uh, explore reality and learn about it. Um, yeah, that's not really an argument for the existence of a god because saying it's self-evident doesn't mean anything. Creation is just called creation out of convenience. I'm actually not really satisfied with calling it creation. I would rather call it existence because we know it exists but we don't know it was created. Um, yeah. And again, like many people have said before me, I'm gonna actually use the same answer because it's just the most simple one. Yeah, um, campfires and turds have been observed to happen, but, so, you know that, you know exactly who did them, but universe were never observed being created, so we don't know if a universe was created. The same way that if you have never seen a camel in your life, 
and you see a camel turd, it is not self-evident that that um, that it's a camel turd. All you know is that there is some brown stuff that's kind of stinky and has flies flying around it and shit, but... Um, yeah, if you've never seen a camel before, there is no possible way that you can um, associate this turd with a camel. And the same way, if you've never seen a god create universes before, you have no way of knowing that the universe was created by God. That's as straightforward, as linear as this thinking is. It's as clear as day to him. That's not even a question. Now I want to come to actually the Qur'an's reasoning. Well, these are very simple way of looking at things. But I want to see if the Qur'an deals with this subject. And you should know that explicitly, the Qur'an does not ask the question or answer the question, does God exist? That is not a question in the Qur'an. It does not, that question doesn't exist. The Qur'an is Allah speaking Himself. No, this is actually a lie because the Qur'an is not Allah speaking Himself. The Qur'an is Muhammad speaking for Allah. And if I'm not mistaken, it took him years and years to write it down. More like it took him years and years to come up with it. So if you really want to believe that Allah has directed Muhammad exactly what to write, then you have to take his word for it. There's no other way to make sure. Is Allah speaking Himself? And He's in conversation with His creations, with you and me. He's in this direct conversation with us. The only questions He asks is, do you really believe it's me talking? Do you really believe that it's, these, are, these words are my own? Because you're not hearing Allah's voice. You're hearing the voice of Muhammad وسلم, and these words are being given to him. So that's the question the Qur'an asks, is this God's word or not? He asks another question related to God, are there other gods that you should be worshipping besides myself? He asks another question, he says, should you, you think you're going to worship yourself and not me? You think you're going to thank someone else other than myself? These are the kinds of questions the Qur'an asks. It never asks the question, does God exist or not? But then another question rises. Out of all of these questions, another question is born. How come the Qur'an never asks that question? How come the Qur'an never deals with the question, does God even exist or not? Why not? Why not deal with this question head on? This is one of the most fundamental problems of philosophy in human history across civilizations. So why not, if this book is for guidance for all of humanity, why not deal with this problem head on? And we find the answer to that in the Qur'an also. Why is it that that's not even a question? Why is it that that's not even a discussion as far as the Qur'an is concerned? If you want to ask my opinion as to why this question is not brought up, I think it's because Muhammad wanted everybody to follow what he's saying without questioning it and without them having any doubts. He wanted to instill this faith onto people without them having any possibility of thinking, without them having any possibility of doubting what they're being told. So if you raise this question, people will have to think about it, will have to consider it, and will have to intellectually approach this question. But that's not what you want to do. You want them to be followers. You want them to do exactly what they're told and when they're told to do it. So, yeah, bringing up questions that might cause people to have doubts is not a very effective method of making them believe what you want to tell them without questioning it. Um, and besides that, I don't think that Muhammad was really intelligent enough to consider the possibility that there is no God. He wasn't really that much of a philosopher, so if you think about it, there is no reason why this question would be brought up in the Quran. And in order to understand that, we have to understand something about ourselves. First I'll tell you a hadith of the Prophet he says, Man arafa nafsahu arafa rabbahu. Whoever knew himself, really knew himself or herself, they truly know their master. If, the, if you really know who you are, then you know who your master is. Now, that seems a little ambiguous at first, so we have to explore that statement through the Quran so we understand what it is that the Prophet is telling us. وسلم, how do you get to know Allah? The, the clue he gave is you have to get to know who first. I don't find any ambiguity here. This statement is actually fairly simple to understand.
according to Muhammad, it is so self-evident that God exists that if you get to know yourself, then you get to know your master. It, it, it's a false statement. It's not an ambiguous one. Um, I'll give you an example. I used to believe in God when I did not know myself. When I was not capable of thinking for myself and recognizing my personality and who I really am beyond my ego. But now that I am able to do that, I can clearly see that there is no reason for me to believe in a God. So, it's not that it's ambiguous, it's just wrong. Who do you have to get to know before you get to know Allah? You have to get to know yourself. If you truly know who you are, yourself, then you'll get to know who Allah is. That's a very strange thing, because all of you would probably answer, I already know myself. My name is so and so, I have a weight problem, I have weak eyesight, I have, I'm this, you know, this old, I flunked out of these many classes, I know a lot about myself. What do you mean I don't know myself? Well actually there's a part of yourself that you know. A part of yourself that you know. But there's another part of yourself that you may not really know that well. This is a part of you that Allah created before you came on this earth. There's a part of you that Allah created before you were, you came out of your mother. It was already in existence. And this part of you, the Quran calls it the ruh, your ruh. I'm not going to translate it as your spirit or your soul or anything else or your personality. I won't give it any of these modern terms. We'll just call it what again? Ruh. I think you're being a little bit dishonest here for the purpose of manipulating your audience. You might not even be aware of the fact that you're lying here because you know perfectly well that it literally translates into a spirit or a soul. And the reason why you try to keep it vague is because you can't argue against things that are vague. Uh, if you say, we don't know exactly what it is, then you can't really argue against something that you don't know what it is. But later on in this video, you actually go to claim credit for your personality as being based in this thing. And the reason why I think you want to keep it vague is because you know that it's not a concept that is new from Islam. Muhammad borrowed it from the hundreds or thousands of religions that came prior to Islam. He just borrowed a concept and planted it into his own made-up religion. And the reason you don't know a lot about it is because this, is, this ruh itself, most of what it is, is a mystery to us. This is something Allah Himself tells us. He says, Yes, alunaka ali ruhi, huli ruhu min amri rabbi, wa ma utitu min al ilmi illa qalila. They ask you about the ruh. Every one of us has a ruh inside us. And Allah says, They ask you about that ruh they have inside of them. Tell them that this ruh is from a special command of my master, and you have very little, you haven't been given knowledge except very, very little. You have been given knowledge, not much knowledge except very, very little of what this ruh actually is, what its function is, what its benefits are. Why do you believe God exists? Because I know myself. What do you mean you know yourself? Well, I have this unknown factor, something inside of me that I can't really explain. I don't know what it is. I can't point to it. I can't recognize it. It's not my personality because that's been proven scientifically to be in my brain. And that's why I believe in God. Wait, but how do you know you have that whatchamacallit inside of you? Well, God told me so. Don't you think that's kind of circular reasoning? If that's your best argument and that's the reason why you believe in God, and that's the reason why you think that it's clear that there's a God, then I think you are probably one of the most dumb people I've ever seen in my life. Honestly, you say that, the, the, that there's no reason to ask the question if God exists or not because you have a spirit. How do you know you have a spirit? Because God said I have a spirit. That is circular logic. Jesus, I hate circular logic.